This is the current federal tax developments for the week of July the 29th, 2024. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers, and this week again from here in Phoenix, we'll look at some of the things that have happened this week in terms of current federal tax developments. And on this week's program, we're going to look first at the fact that FinCEN has added two more questions to the BOI FAQ page. Actually, what they did was they modified and added significantly to one and created a secondary one dealing with the situation where an entity may be considered a disregarded entity for tax purposes, might still have a separate filing obligation under the BOI rules. And how do we deal with their tax identification number in that situation? Because they don't really have a separate EIN. They're using the EIN of the entity that they're considered to be disregarded because it owns 100% of them. So we'll talk a little bit about that issue. We're also going to talk about five new warning signs for problematic ERC claims that the IRS added to their list. Uh, which was added to based on some experiences they've had with actual examinations of ERC claims, plus give us an announcement that things are coming for the program and uh, for us to watch for that announcement in the near future. And then finally, another employee retention credit development, this time a chief counsel memorandum that outlines the position on how tax exempt organizations are supposed to apply rules similar to the rules of Section 52A and B uh, to their ERC claims when, in fact, 52 didn't apply to tax-exempt orgs because they weren't eligible for the basically for most of the jobs credits because it was an income tax credit. And there are no Treasury regulations outlining how to apply and determine you know, what's a related group in that context. So we'll talk a little bit about how what the Chief Counsel suggests as a potential reasonable interpretation, which while not technically a safe harbor because it is just a chief counsel advice, is a pragmatic technical safe harbor. And also, though, talk about the fact that what's the point? Does this mean you have to follow this? We'll talk a little bit about that and maybe briefly touch on, you know, the, does Looper Bright, the Looper Bright decision of the Supreme Court, really have any impact on whether you need to follow this one way or the other? So a little bit about that, because that last topic is one I've seen discussed a bit in a couple of articles. And I have my own thoughts on how that's going to work, especially in cases like this. So let's go ahead and let's talk first about what happened with the FinCEN uh, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. You don't know who they are. And they're frequently asked questions on the beneficial ownership information reports that are coming up due for most entities on January 1st of 2025. And what happens here is this FAQ was set up about a year ago. Little, little was it maybe a little less than a year ago, uh, but they've set up and put on there. Now, actually, we got a first PDF version of FAQs back in March of 2024. That's been around for over a year, but the online version, or let's say the web-based version, that one's been around since I think it was last June, July, somewhere in that range, they put it up that way. And since then, FinCEN has regularly gone in and updated the FAQ, either adding questions, they do that quite a bit, or revising prior answers. So even if you've been following along, and even if you, let's say, have you know gone through the FAQs in the past, uh, you may want to go back and check. Each question does tell you the date it was last updated. But let's say if you hadn't really looked at the FAQ since September of 23, well, you can figure out which questions are either brand new or which questions have been modified since that time you checked it. So we'll take a look, you know, kind of go through that. The two questions we have, the two things they did, uh, the first one talks about what to do about tax disregard entities. And employee identification numbers for a disregard entity is not required to get an EIN. You know, how do we handle that? Because it is possible, very possible, that while this entity is disregarded for federal income tax purposes, it still has to file separately from its owner for purposes of the BOI. So we'll talk a little bit about that and how they say to deal with that. And also they, they really added to a answer they had dealing with a big problem we run into. That is that if you don't have a U.S. responsible party, right, who's filing, let's say you don't have any U.S. shareholders, everything is overseas entity, but they're setting up some operations in the U.S. So they have an LLC formed in the United States. 
Uh, how do we get them an ID number in time to meet the filing requirement rules? And it's also been a problem because a number of people have reported, and even my partners run into this, that recently they've had issues with the IRS and getting an EIN online uh, where the IRS has requested that they contact them separately and submit things via fax and the like, and so go through kind of a paper system. So the problem is becoming now, what if we form a new LLC and we can't get an EIN, right? We don't have an EIN. And remember, the timing for filing this thing starts when the state recognizes the entity, and most likely, you know, in theory, you really shouldn't apply for an EIN on behalf of an entity until one has an entity. So yeah, not, not a minor detail. So let's talk about the questions. We're gonna review them here, right? In terms of how this whole thing works and what exactly is going on. So with it, let's go ahead and let's take a look at, you know, what type of tax identification number should be reported by a reporting company that's disregarded for US tax purposes, right? This deals with that problem we just discussed. Now, if this entity is disregarded for U.S. tax purposes, we all know that, right? Single member LLC, entirely owned by a, you know, whatever, another LLC, a corporation, a trust, right? An individual. That single member LLC disregarded entity by default unless it elects to be treated as a corporation, right? And instead of being taxed separately, the owner basically reports its income and deductions as part of the owner's federal tax return. Now, generally, that discard entity must report its information, right? Defense and if it's a reporting company, which generally they're going to be, right? The fact that you have, so I'm thinking about the situation where we have a individual taxpayer who owns rental properties and has set up an LLC to hold each property. Those rental properties are going to be, those LLCs holding rental properties are going to each be a reporting entity. They're also almost certainly gonna be a discard entity because we're probably gonna keep those as a single member LLC, right? They probably have no employees and otherwise they wouldn't need an EIN. In fact, you know, it's gonna be, they may not be required to get one. Maybe they don't have a bank account even. They just keep paying everything out of personal account which may cause some attorneys to get very nervous about whether that LLC is going to stand up if challenged, but you know, gang, things like that happen. So let's say they've had no need to get an EIN. Nobody's been pushed on that, right? Now a reporting company must provide one of the following types of taxpayer information numbers on its BOI report if it's been issued a TIN. That'll be the EIN, a social security number, or an individual taxpayer identification number. If it's a foreign reporting company has been issued a TIN, then it must provide a tax identification number issued by a reporting jurisdiction and the name of that jurisdiction, right? Uh, consistent with the IRS's rules, though, we're going to use the TINs, different types of tax identification numbers may be reported for different discard entities under different circumstances. It's going to walk you through the options. Uh, if the entity has its own EIN, it reports that as its taxpayer identification number. If this card entity does not have an EIN, it is not required to obtain one to meet the BOI reporting requirements as long as it can instead provide another type of TIN. Okay, or if a foreign entity is not issued TIN, a tax identification number issued by the foreign jurisdiction, right, and the name of that jurisdiction, right? If it's a single member limited liability company, single member LLC, or otherwise has only one owner, there's an individual with an SSN or ITIN, this card entity may report the individual's social security number or ITIN as its TIN. So in essence, that person who has 35 rentals inside 35 separate LLCs can use their social security numbers as a reporting ID number for each one of those single member LLCs, right? They each don't have to get a EIN. If this current entity is owned by a US entity that has an EIN, then it may report that other entity's EIN as its TIN. Again, it does not have an EIN. Now remember, generally if this entity has employees, it needs to get an EIN, which case then you would use that to report. But if it doesn't have employees, doesn't otherwise get one because you know the bank doesn't require them to get one or they don't have a bank account, whatever it might be, then you could go and use the parent's corporation, LLC, uh, whatever owns this trust, whatever owns it, you'd use its EIN. 
if it's owned by another discard entity or a, basically or a chain of discard entities discard entity may report the tin of the first owner up the chain of discard entities that has a tin as its tin so under that view let's assume we had a discard entity llc it's holding some assets but has no employees but it's owned by an llc that also is a single member llc owned by an individual but that single member LLC does have employees and has an EIN. In that case, we could use the EIN of the LLC. That's still a single member LLC, but as an EIN for payroll tax purposes, we could use that for all of the discard entities that it owns that don't have their own EIN. And in many cases, we'll have a chain of these. So that would be how it would work and how we'd report it. Right? That's how it goes. Uh, as explained, as I said, as explained in this question, a discard entity that is a reporting company must report one of these tax ID numbers. You can't say none. So when reporting beneficial ownership information defends them. But the interesting part here is you can use for that rental property, right? That let's say does not have a separate checking account. You can go ahead and just use the EIN of, you know, basically you can do social security number of the individual that owns the partnership or owns the single member LLC, not a partnership. Okay. So that handles the discard entity question, which, you know, up until now, I think probably a lot of people had started believing they had to go get an EIN because they had to provide an ID number, right? There wasn't clear authority that said I could go up the line. So if that entity has to file, I'm sure some people have gotten EINs at this point. Now, how do I obtain a taxpayer identification for a new company quickly so that I can file an initial beneficial ownership information report on time? And the big problem here is if for whatever reason you cannot get the EIN online, if you can get it online, it is like a same day operation. Okay. The most recent one I got, which was for a trust where the basically the grantor of the trust had passed away. So the trust converted from a grantor trust because it was fully revocable during the grantor's life to a now taxable entity. It's no longer a grantor trust, so I have to file a return. I mean, I got that filed, you know, within a few minutes after getting the trust document. So I have the trust name and other de details in front of me, right? Took very quickly. But my partner was trying to get a similar EIN for a trust and you know, got that whole bit of, you know, we got to call the IRS. You got to do other things. And a couple of CPAs I know of have also reported running into that on some occasions here recently, and some people have run into it quite a bit. So now we got a problem. What happens here? How we do it? Generally, you've got to provide one of the following types of taxpayer identification numbers on your BOI report. Now, remember, with these trusts, they weren't required to, they generally aren't required to file a BOI report. But if instead of a trust, we'd be looking for an EIN for an LLC, that's when we suddenly have the potential issue here. So you need to provide an EIN, right? A social security number, uh, or if an individual tax identification number or ITIN, if it's a foreign reporting company, it's not been issued an ITIN, it must provide a tax ID number issued by the foreign jurisdiction, right? And they talk about the IRS talk, and they set, remind you, there's this free EIN application form which, you know, don't file the paper form is what they're telling you, right? Don't do it. Go online and get the number because that number will be gotten immediately and that eliminates this whole problem. But the question arises of what if you are in a situation where you cannot get that number online, right? So, okay, IRS talks about all those things, but now let's go in. Like they said, most sporting companies should be able to use the IN online application to apply for the IN. However, there may be situations where they need to follow form SS4 application to apply for an EIN. And in particular, if the responsible party for the applicant is a foreign person that does not have a social security number or ITIN, they will not be able to use the online application portal. And for information about completing and submitting that, you know, read the submit it by mail. But now we got a problem. We're submitting it in a process that's likely going to take quite a while to get the number back, right? So for forms submitted by fax, you generally receive their EIN in four business days. Uh, by mail, they may receive it in four to five weeks. However, in some circumstances, it may take six to eight weeks. Either way you go there to receive your EIN. 
and in some limited circumstances, a reporting company with no other tax identification number may not be able to obtain its EIN by its reporting deadline date. Okay, that's a problem at $591 a day, potentially. So, what do they say about that? They, now, they say very quickly, you do not try to file without it and say applied for or something of that sort, because it won't accept it, right? You will not be able to submit your BOI report unless you have an ID number on the application, right? Um, they say you should make all reasonable attempts to obtain that timely, right? Including requesting honest information as soon as practicable. Uh, but the reporting company should file its report as soon as it receives an EIN if it doesn't have it on the due date. And they say, as a best practice, I love this, to have a chance of arguing for the fact that you shouldn't be penalized, uh, be sure to consider retaining documentation associated with your efforts to comply. Make a printout of the page that turns you down for the EIN online. Make a printout of any instructions you receive. You know, notes, memorandums about anything. If you call the IRS on a phone call about what you were told you had to send, uh, information, therefore, on date submitted, and information on the date you finally received the EIN, right? Keep that around. The argument's going to be if you do get dinged for, hey, wait, we just checked the state, you know, you know, you, you basically had 90 days to file from the date the state recognized you, and you didn't file until 120 days after, you can show that, in fact, you filed on the date you finally got the EIN and all of these things that kept you from getting it until the date was 120 days after the entity was recognized by the state, assuming it's formed in 2024. And obviously, in 25, that's going to go down to 30 days instead of 90 days you have. So then it's going to become much more likely you're going to run into one of these problems that you can't get around. So... FinCEN did give us an out here. Uh, the initial discussion did not say anything like what we see here at the end, where they said, you know, well, keep all documentation, you know, and they still aren't saying here that you will get out of a penalty, right? All they're saying is, you know, they're implying it. We, we can take this to mean, I think it is a way to read this, is that they're going to ask you for that as they consider not penalizing you, assuming a penalty issue comes up. So make sure you have that information available that you can document what you did. Okay, next up, we have an IRS news release, IR 2024-198, issued on July the 26th. And it's entitled, IRS loves long titles on these web pages and news releases. The IRS shares more warning signs of incorrect claims for the employee retention credit, urges businesses to proactively resolve erroneous claims to avoid penalties, interest, and audit. This particular one was, as it's noted here, a news release, right? This is how the IRS has done most of these on the ERC. It's been news releases. Now, they do add, which we'll walk you through, five new warning signs of problematic ERC refund claims, and they're basing these on what they're encountering as they're working their way through the backlog of ERC claims. And I have heard of people now recently, a number of people who have taxpayers that have received the uh basically the letter that says, tough luck, guys, we're denying your claim, right? So those are starting to go out to some extent. Now, remember, when that comes out, you do have appellate rights, but also remember that ultimately, if the IRS, you know, if you cannot win on appeals, you're going to have the deadline from the from two years from the date that the IRS turned down the claim. You have two years from that date in order to file in district court and basically challenge them on their disallowance. From reports I've heard from some people, they seem to be just straight out disallowing. Uh, they're not really asking for more details. That's probably because it fits their, it, it fits what they've discovered are claims of a sort that most often when they tried to get information before, nobody had it. Um, so by the way, I always thought when filing these claims, you know, assume you're going to persuade them. Don't just give the conclusion, in my view, that you qualified based upon, you know, you qualified based on government orders with no more explanation. 
probably helps to explain what the justification was, what the order was, the particular part of the order, how it applied to your business, the impact it had on your business and why that qualified. In essence, take them through the whole process instead of just, I realized the 941X didn't ask for much, right? It asked for an explanation with no real discussion of what you had to say. And some people therefore want to do skeletal. My theory was, as I saw how this program started spiraling out of control, that a skeletal refund claim was almost certainly going to just get a straight up rejection. Uh, or at best, you'd get this request for correspondence to provide all that detail, all the detail you had, and it'd be stuck way back in the background to be reviewed. So I always thought it made a lot more sense to, in essence, at least make it clear that you have details, maybe not submit all the huge amount of paperwork you would to actually back it up, although some people I'm sure would do that, but rather go ahead and submit, you know, make it clear to the service that the backup exists, right? You might do a quick claim. You might refer to documents that you have, uh, you know, but basically always have the backup there because right now I think having a very thin ERC claim especially if it's not something that can be easily documented or explained, like, you know, your client was forced to close their office and they paid the employees for the time they weren't working, right? That's a pretty simple one. That one could be a thin claim. But if we're talking about partial, a partial suspension for what was otherwise a business that is considered, you know, essential, then we better have a better discussion about why we had a partial shutdown. And what exactly worked for that if there's not a nice, simple order saying close the doors, right? Close the doors or, you know, do things like this. If we don't have those in back in the background, then maybe we need more documentation. Maybe we need to have submitted something better. But that, that's water under the bridge at this point, right? Most of these claims have been done. They also added an announcement regarding future ERC enforcement steps. What's going to go on with the program in the future? as they discussed that this week. Now, this was the paragraph that explains the basics before they get to, you know, the five items and then all the other items they had before, repeat those one more time, and then telling you about your ways of getting out of this, which pretty much are what they were before. The withdrawal program is still there. Uh, there are various other ways you need to kind of double check on everything, et cetera, and maybe have somebody other than the initial uh, promoter, review your claim, all those sorts of things. But what they're saying is the coming days, the IRS plans to issue more information on new compliance work involving high-risk claims, right? As well as audits, as well as details about an anticipated short-term reopening of the voluntary disclosure program. Now, remember, that's been discussed before. We had a voluntary disclosure program that closed in March, where you were allowed to effectively get out of it uh, and still keep, but that, that assumed you'd been paid your refund. You were allowed to get out of it and still keep your 20%, right? Keep 20% of what you had received and pay back the rest. And at that one also waived interest, it waived penalties. It was a very nice program, right? Now, they're going to reopen a program, but be aware, it is wildly unlikely that it will be exactly the same program or be as generous as that program. We don't know how much less generous it'll be, but I think it is safe to say that it will be less generous. If it were to be as generous as before, they're probably gonna find not many people will partake in it. Why? Uh, because the theory is being, well, I just won't do it now. I'll wait and see if, it, you know, I'll kind of wait out and see how many exams are really able to do. And only if I think there's a big risk would I go in and then pay my money back. Okay, so I know that's what the issue. So the IRS ha has to start putting some pressure on here by making it clear if you keep waiting for voluntary programs to open, you're going to find out every time you wait, things get worse. So could be this time you just have to pay back the entire amount. You don't get to keep the 20%. Tough luck, you paid that to the promoter. But maybe they'd still waive interest and penalties. Or maybe they waive it. Maybe they no longer waive interest and penalties, but they'll let you keep the 20%. You know, it's tough to know what's going to go on, or there'll be a proportion, get a reduction in interest and penalties if you come in, and maybe get to keep 10% of it. Tough to say what it would be, but just be aware, uh, watch out for the details there, and expect that, again, like last time, 
It'll probably be open for a few months. The idea is come in now or we're closing it again. And if it does reopen, it will be less, you know, it'll be less taxpayer friendly than what we just offered this time. Okay. And an important update about impending processing of low risk payments dealt small businesses with legitimate claims. So this is kind of interesting, right? In terms of high risk claims, which right now appears to be the IRS is going and very quickly disallowing once they've determined a claim fits the high risk profile, they're just flat out disallowing. Um, which, as I said, it, you know, is a good chunk of those out there. There's also ones that have the intermediate risk, you know, where they, they still are doubtful about them, but they need more information. And we'll see if they start issuing those. Do you notice they're not talking about those here, though? And then they talk about the low risk claims. And my guess is they want to announce some way of how they're going to start paying those out and potentially even notifying taxpayers that their claim has been deemed low risk. So therefore, you know, their payment will be coming. Again, that's a guess. We don't know what's saying of that, but it does mean to keep your eyes open for what the IRS, you know, may very well be doing here. Okay, now let's talk about the five new warning signs. Uh, one thing that they have discovered inside of the program is they have found essential businesses like our accounting, my accounting firm was an essential business, right? Our CPA firm and most of yours probably was considered an essential business, at least on the tax processing side and compliance side for that sort of thing. And they found a lot of those during the pandemic that could fully operate and did not have a decline in gross receipts either. So they have, let's say, a CPA firm, right? A CPA firm that was considered to be essential, right? It is applying for an ERC credit for a period where they had no restrictions on their operation and their gross receipts did not go down, they went up, right? They've discovered that promoters have convinced these businesses to claim the ERC when in many instances they weren't eligible because their operations weren't fully or partially suspended by a qualifying governmental order. Uh, modifications did not affect your ability to operate. This is the IRS position. Like requiring employees to wash their hands or wear masks does not mean the business operations were suspended. And the IRS urges businesses, essential business, to review eligibility rules and examples related to government orders. If you were considered an essential business in your state, if what you do appears to be essential, you're a CPA firm, right? Your services were deemed essential. You know, you were a supermarket. Your services, you know, selling food to the public was deemed essential. And you have an ERC claim out there. Yeah, you might want to review it. Now, again, is the IRS, you know, I'm sure that some will say, well, wait, wait, that, that whole bit about those things don't qualify came solely from the notices. I understand that. But I do understand that if your client has done this, realize the IRS is going to classify them probably as high risk. And that means they're going to take them out. So you may be, in essence, you're almost certainly being told by this, if you're, you meet these criteria, you're probably going to have a disallowance as a high-risk claim. Now, that doesn't mean you might not win on the position if you went to court. But your client's got to realize something. There is a high probability or a very high possibility that they would have to go to court in order to win this claim and they might find themselves subject to certain penalties uh, if they try to keep pursuing the claim. So, or if they've re already received the money and this is their fact pattern. Because again, the IRS is kind of telegraphing to you in some ways, where I read these five, of what they would consider to be a high risk claim based on their experience with processing these. They never say that here, but remember they claimed high risk claims were based on their experience and they could identify them. So I would assume the, these are things that meet the high risk criteria, right? The business is unable to support how a government order fully or partially suspended business operations. Uh, whether a business was fully or partially suspended depends on its specific operations. When asked for proof on how the government order suspended more than a nominal portion of their business operations, many businesses haven't provided enough information to confirm eligibility. This gets back to that skinny claim. Now, this says when asked, my guess is you, the IRS may decide that since so many of those businesses can't provide any information about how this order affected them, 
you know, or even sometimes what order, um, yeah, they may decide to start disallowing them. So again, if there's a skinny claim and there is no, there is no information provided about what order we're talking about, and there's no information about how that order specifically impacted this business operations and how that led to a partial suspension, uh, yeah, you've got a, you got a high risk claim. You know, your client should be ready to get that information together and maybe consider even revising their refund claim to add the details, right, to make it clear. So as I said, if it's a skinny claim, I would be a little worried about the fact they may just get a disallowance letter and they may find that appeals isn't too much interest in hearing from them either, at which point then, you know, you're going to have to go to district court and at district court, you're definitely going to provide these details anyway, so... You know, you might as well. Remember, it's up to you to prove your, the case. And the law pretty clearly says that you must have a full or partial suspension related to a government order that meets certain criteria. So it doesn't matter if the notice is valid or invalid. The mere fact the notice is invalid doesn't mean the law is invalid, right? So you have to be able to show a proper interpretation of the law. The words in the text of the statute have meaning. And no, Right. You know, the Supreme Court's ruling on no longer granting Chevron deference is not relevant to that part. That part, they didn't overturn the rule that says that, you know, you've got to follow the law. You know, you've got to do this. And I'm finding some people who think that somehow, you know, the, the Looper case um, essentially means that, oh, well, we're going to be able to do that. The regs invalid. And then whatever we say goes, it's like, no, you still have a burden of proving that your interpretation of the law is reasonable, which means I need an interpretation of the law. And since the law requires me to have a, you know, show that I had a full or partial suspension that was tied to a government order, I'm going to have to show the link, right? I don't, d ignore the notice, totally ignore the notice. And I will say that's still what happens, right? If the notice is irrelevant, fine. Crumple it up, throw it away, burn it. But the law is still there. And the law has the wording in it. And that's why I think this one especially is one that if, you're, if your promoter merely keeps saying Looper Bright case, Looper Bright, Looper Bright, you got big problems. Because you're going to need to be able to show this if you end up challenging it in court. And do not expect the IRS to grant the refund until such time as you provide this information. Uh, business reporting family members' wages as qualified wages. Okay, this goes back to my article back in April of 2021. I believe, yeah, it was April of 21. Uh, when we started discussing this whole Section 52 problem and what I refer to as the no living relative rule, right? If there is a control employee. And, you know, a lot of people complained. A lot of people told me that it was, that's not congressional intent. Now, what I always found funny about that, because again, Looper Bright could come into this argument but I'm saying, okay, where do you have, where do you find the congressional intent? Actually, two rules here. Number one, under the Germain case, and I would say here the Germain case works perfectly. If the law itself is clear, if the law itself here is clear using standard tools of statutory interpretation, that doesn't mean that any, you know, any untrained person on the street can understand it. But if using standard tools of statutory interpretation, the law is clear, right? So using the standard tools a court would use, is this thing, does it doesn't have no ambiguity? If it has no ambiguity, it doesn't matter. We've talked about the Germain case in the past. It does not matter that Congress didn't mean to do it. If they write it in the law, that is what they meant to do, or at least that is what the courts are going to go with. The court's theory is Congress, if you can't figure out how to write English, then tough luck. We're going to enforce what you write. So if that's not what you meant, you need to get back together, modify the law to say what you meant, and change the law. In this case, I'm going to say and go back to that April article from way back, April of 21 article, uh, which actually talks about Area 51. So you want to search for kernfelddexvotes.com and Area 51, you'll almost certainly get the article. Uh, you know, because that, that's kind of how we, we phrase this, call it that, because, you know, the various Code Section 51 issues. But remember, if I have a majority owner, then I cannot claim wages paid to any of the following related parties to that majority owner. 
So not to them, their spouse, their child or a descendant of a child, their brother, sister, stepbrother or stepsister, their father or mother or an ancestor of either, their stepfather or stepmother, their niece or nephew, aunt or uncle, son-in-law, daughter-in-law, father-in-law, mother-in-law, brother-in-law, or sister-in-law, and any household member, meaning an individual who for the taxable year of the taxpayer has the same principal resident vote as the taxpayer and is a member of the taxpayer's household. Now of that group, only the last one I think is an interpretation that's not necessarily what you have to get from the law. But all those others, the specific names of child, descendant, brother, sister, stepbrother, all of those are words that are in the statute if you follow the cross references. Now you have to go to section 51, then you have to go to section, I forget which one it is, 267. You know, but, but you're gonna follow the directions. It keeps cross referencing you and you're gonna find that exact list, right? I had that list well before the notice ever came out. I have that list, that article that was well before the notice. And I said, this is the law. And I'm saying it because I got it directly from the statutes following cross-references. And it doesn't matter if Congress didn't intend it unless they, the wording they have is ambiguous. And it's not. They borrowed the wording specifically from what they use for the jobs credit. So is this a stupid rule? Yes. Because, by the way, the majority owner can receive ERC credit so long as they have nobody on that list that is currently living except for their spouse. I mean, which basically is weirdly on that, but it's kind of weird and it gets into the weird back and forth. That's what's called the no living relative rule. And if you get out the notice that everybody's screaming about here in 2021, which is 2021-20, there is an example in there of how no, how a, without any relatives, without any living descendants, uh, no living descendants, no living uh, ancestors for either you or your, if you're married, your spouse, then don't worry about the rule. You can own 100% of the S Corp and you can still get the ERC on your wages. But if you have a living child or a living parent or a living, you know, niece or nephew, right? All of, I think that was it right there. They are. I don't know. Nieces and yeah, niece and nephews are in there. You know, so if you have any of those currently alive, they're still alive then. And the article discusses why this is true. But again, it just comes straight from the statute. There's going to be a splash back onto you. And so you're going that person will be deemed to own every share you own or every percent of interest you own. And when we do that, then you're going to be one of this, you're going to have this relationship to that other person. So the no living relative rule. This is something IRS checks for that. You know, they'll look for your kids. Easy way to find your kids, your 1040s, right? Who owns a majority of the company? Okay, on their 1040, who are their kids? Who they claim as dependents, right, for kids? Who have they claimed in the past? Because obviously kid is kid, right? It doesn't matter they're no longer a, can be claimed as a dependent, they're still your kid, right? Sorry, that, that continues as long as they're alive. They're going to be your kid, right? So go to check and do that. So again, if you've done, if they've claimed those, I don't care what, I don't care. That one I'll put my foot down on. I don't claim what the promoter said. I don't see any way that works aside from, I have a little bit of argument with the last one. Uh, but otherwise, I, I don't see how you, you're going to win. It has nothing to do with the notice. It has everything to do with the law, right? My article well predates the notice. But amazingly, it's right in line with it, okay? Business using wages already used for Paycheck Protection Program loan forgiveness. I don't doubt the IRS is double checking with SBA to see if this business got a PPP loan. And if it did, right, then they're going to probably say, wait, we've got no evidence here that you excluded wages that you use for your PPP loan, and we're going to want you to prove that. And again, if nobody's done that work, then don't be surprised to get a straight up disallowance. You know, the IRS's theory at this point is probably we don't have time to deal with you. You know, if, if you want to, if you want to put the evidence forward, that's fine. And you can go to appeals and try to get stuff there, which at that point, then they'll probably send you back to exam 
Uh, but still, you know, it, it's not one of those things you're going to worry about. Sorry about that. You know, so be careful there if you've got that. The PPP loan program, you know, make sure if you're claiming during a period where PPP loans, uh, you know, essentially were still, you know, in place, the periods they covered, and your your application applies to that, you better be able to show that you did or didn't get a PPP loan. If you did get a PPP loan, you better be able to identify which wages were used to get your PPP loan forgiveness, assuming you've applied for the forgiveness. Again, if you never apply for forgiveness, well, that's fine, except, yeah, we'll see what the service does in that case. Uh, you still could apply, uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll get a little messy there. You got to show that you're not going to, right? If for gay use loan, you can't claim the ERC on wages that were reported to payroll costs against PPP loan forgiveness. Uh, participating in this program affects the amount of qualified wages used to calculate the ERC. Payroll costs up to the SBA, payroll costs on the amount the SBA forgave aren't eligible for the ERC. Uh, you know, and taxpayers can use the rest of other qualifying wages. So you need to show me that you had enough wages that you could wipe out the PPP loan and you still had enough other qualifying, and, and the other wages you didn't use for that, that those wages are sufficient to still get you the qualification for the ERC you claimed. Now, if you've done the work, you've got the work papers, right? But in a lot of cases, you know, there were a lot of fly-by-night operators in the ERC uh, consulting area. And because of that, I will warn you real quickly that I think there are perfectly valid claims, but they were put out by a group that was just papering as many claims they could get and hope the IRS just sent checks. And, you know, those perfectly valid claims are going to be caught up in this, well, you know, th this appears to be a, you know, high-risk ERC claim that gets disallowed. Um, and I think that's a huge issue. And like it or not, that's going to be a major problem because a lot of these claims simply weren't backed up enough. And we also talk about large employers uh, claiming wages for employees provided services. Remember, if you were a large eligible, em eligible employer, you could only claim the ERC for wages paid to employees who are not currently providing services to you, right? And those large employers were those that averaged more than 100 full-time employees in 2019 and claimed the ERC for 2020 tax period, and or they had more than 500 full-time employees in 2019 and claimed the ERC for 2021. So if you meet that criteria, they want to see, you know, did you provide some proof that you had limited your claim to employees who simply were doing no work? Right. If you included those, if you included all wages there as a large employer and you're telling me you're only partially suspended, I'm getting very suspicious. Right. So be, be careful there in that issue. And again, the problem is that most, you know, a lot of these fly by night consultants were just doing claims as fast as they could. And if you're doing that, you skip things like this. Right. Because, again, it's a one size fit all with in many cases. Unfortunately, if you're if you're really just fly by night, you you didn't really get you didn't go out there and, and hire a bunch of highly skilled people to do a lot of work to back up these claims. You simply you want to hire as many as possible to process because you knew that if you were too detailed and you were telling people that didn't qualify, that they would just dump you and go somewhere else. So there, there was definitely an advantage to being the least picky consultant when filing these and to file forms as fast as possible. So that's not a good thing, but unfortunately, it is the way this sort of thing works. So bottom line, right? Th this is one of the issues that we have. Now, the other thing we've got here, let's talk about a couple of issues. Number one, as I've said, um, I think there are valid claims that will have these things attached to them. Um, I think in many of those cases, the problem is a skinny application, right? Uh, you, but you need to tell clients, and I would tell my client too, great, you had a skinny application. I'm, I, I think you can qualify. But you've already put yourself behind the eight ball by using this other fly-by-night operation. So we're going to have to talk about getting the details. Uh, and you're going to need to pay me to do this work, right? I'm, I'm, I'm doing the work because I'm going to actually determine if you qualify. Because right now, you know, you are basically getting nothing. So if you want me to try to recover what I think is very likely you might owe, well, I'm sorry, but I got to do the background work and I don't work for free. 
That's my bias. I know you paid those guys six figures. That's wonderful. Um, and now you can't find them, right? Or they claim they'll defend you, but I, you know, we're looking at their defense, and it seems like well, that, that's a, basically just a stall for time at, so they can figure out how to leave the country in the interim. Or, you know, you could say things like that, or the way it would look. But anyway, you know, basically it does not appear their defense is very robust or very likely to succeed. Um, you know, clients have to make tough choices. It's not, you know, it's not my job. I, I don't need to bail them out. In fact, that is probably one of the ways that you get in trouble in malpractice cases is when you try to solve a problem that is not of your making. And, you know, and the client will then decide, well, you, you, you told them to go away from these people, whatever you did, whatever you did. And that's why they lost it. Because again, I am certain that the people that, you know, do this, are going to, you know, basically try to throw the blame somewhere else if it gets disallowed. Uh, that, that's just what they've been doing. And it's dangerous to get involved there unless the client has decided that these guys don't make any sense. You know, and I'll tell them flat out, you know, you, you want to go with them, you can. Right? I'm not going to tell you to go with me because I may very well tell you you don't qualify. And I can never guarantee you that the service might not just get dumb and let something go through, or that maybe there will be court cases that validate this wacko claim they've got. And you, you were lucky not having to file the case. Okay, all of those things are possible. But I am going to say that if I'm going to step in and do this, I don't do contingency fees. Right? That's not how I work. You know, because I'm, I'm in here because I think right now this is so screwed up that looking at this claim, nobody could tell whether you do or don't qualify. So, and it's not automatic. It's not as simple as they told you. So they've already lied to you once. Now, you want to go back and trust them now they'll get to do it right? But again, I'm not working for zero. I may very well tell you qualify for nothing, and I'm going to stop if I think that is the answer and you know, offer it to you. But, you know, you, you, you basically make a decision. But be careful here. Again, if clients are involved in this, consider withdrawing a claim. Uh, consider maybe voluntarily paying back the claim. I realize voluntary disclosure program will reopen. The only problem with waiting for that announcement is if the IRS comes after you before they reopen the program, it's too late almost to get in the program. So that's one of those things to talk with legal counsel about how you might get yourself back in. And remember, the other problem we had with the voluntary disclosure program in the past, which I expect will still be true, is Voluntary Disclosure Program did not give you any protection from criminal liability. So, and I do not expect to see criminal liability relief offered in a later Voluntary Disclosure Program, because that, that, would, that would be a little interesting that they waive that at this point, uh, especially if they won't at least go back and retroactively give it to the other people. So, yeah. Just be aware of all the mess there. Finally, this week, we have a Chief Counsel Advice. It's also in the ERC. Chief Counsel Advice 2024-3007, which was issued on July the 26th. Now, the Employee Retention Credit Law in the CARES Act, eventually that made its way into the IRC, says that rules like Section 52 or 51 A and C, A and B, getting the right S, but like, like th those rules like that, in those, those rules apply to tax exempt organizations determine related employers. Now, the problem is those rules were meant to be tied to the employee, basically, you know, the jobs credit, which was an income tax credit. If you're a tax exempt employer, right, you basically didn't have any income taxes. So income tax credits didn't really help you much. But we did have these rules for the income tax credit, right? And the ERC is a payroll tax credit. And so tax exempts qualify for it. But so what does it mean, rules like those, when you're in a category where those rules never applied, right? And Treasury says, well, they realize there are no Treasury regulations applying these rules to tax exempt organizations as the underlying, you know, credit uh, basically normally doesn't apply to tax exempt organizations. So essentially, there are no regs on how to do this. However, they said, well, because of that, the tax organization must apply a reasonable good faith interpretation of the law when determining how the, these rules apply to an exempt organization. And they give a discussion of what will be a quasi safe harbor. So let's start about those rules for your standard tax exempt. 
as I said, because those rules, you know, right, no rules have been regarded how you would apply the 52 rules to a tax exempt organization. A tax exempt organization must apply a reasonable and good faith interpretation of the controlled group rules in determining its eligibility for and the amount of the ERC. And they do suggest you could apply a regulation found in the pension organization rules, right? Uh, where you modify and use controlled group and apply 50% instead of 80%. Uh, you know, by a tax organization would be treated as a reasonable, good faith interpretation of these rules, right? That you do it consistently. Okay. Now, let, let's talk about two points about th this, this ruling. This is a CCA, which means it is merely the IRS's interpretation. Uh, so it's like a legal memo from a tax attorney. And this is the tax attorneys who work for the IRS. But it's still a legal memo from a tax attorney. So arguably, you know, it does have somebody with an area of expertise in the area. But again, it doesn't mean it's flawless or that a court is going to agree with it. However, I will say this much about what we have here. Given the rules of statutory interpretation, I, I think the courts are very clearly going to say, well, those rules are in there, that reference is in there for a reason. And Congress could have excluded tax exempts from it, but they didn't. So that implies to me that it has to apply. So we need a reasonable, good faith interpretation of how it would apply. And arguably, th this is automatically an area where there is, you know, it's not absolutely crystal clear. We do have basically a very, very much a, a level of ambiguity, which is the key word, about how this should be applied. It is not black letter law simple, where there is one and only one way to read the law. Now, I realize with Looper Bright, we might say that the courts will eventually decide there is one best way and there's one best reasonable interpretation out there. That's the theoretical of Looper Bright. Uh, the next 10 years or so will tell us how that theoretical plays out in real world cases. But that's a theoretical backing of Looper Bright. There is one true best interpretation of the law out there. Um, but again, without the IRS doing it currently, you, you are pretty much going to be fine if your interpretation, since there was no IRS guidance, is at least a reasonable interpretation of the law, there's a high chance the court is going to give you deference, right? Is going to say, yeah, we're accepting that because IRS, you really didn't provide any guidance and we find this to be a reasonable way of reading it. Or they could apply to Looper Bright and then it's going to be simply, well, the IRS has their position here in court, you have yours, so we're going to find out which is the better of the two, whatever. Uh, it doesn't mean that you get whatever you want. And what they offer here with that use of regulation 1.414C-5B and how it would apply to determine the controlled group, they're, they're saying if you use that rule as it applies there for pension plans, we're looking to ready organization to see if it's a part of a controlled group and has to combine plans. If you apply those rules and that definition, that is going to be automatically considered to be a reasonable interpretation. Now, shouldn't say automatically because there's just a CCA. So the IRS is, doesn't have to follow it, but a court might be very skeptical if they didn't. And they might be very skeptical of the service now trying to tell me that it's not a reasonable interpretation of law when right here they say it is. So yeah, that, that this will probably, this could be an issue. So for practical purposes, that rule would work. But again, doesn't mean that is the only rule that could work, but this is the one we know if you follow this, that the IRS is essentially stuck with accepting how you combined your groups or you kept things out of a group. That's important. Now, there's another complication here because these pension regulations don't apply to church plans. Church plans get exempted from most of the ERISA and other rules, so now this is a problem. Well, the CCA advises that if the church looks to those rules, you know, even though they don't apply to them, if they use those rules, Right? If they apply those rules, that would again be a reasonable good faith interpretation because this is a way we do statutory interpretation. Right? Okay, is there something similar in the law that speaks to this? And the plan rules would speak to it. And the plan rules do have in them, you know, these 50% instead of 80% rules. So, you know, the court may very well say, well, you know, that apparently is what they mean. Because for a for profit, that would be how they'd test it. So yes, you know, we, we think we're going to borrow that. So that is a method of interpreting the statute, you know, looking for something similar 
in a you know similar type of statute. So you're going to be allowed. That's good too. So the IRS continues and notes that there have not been any, you know, have e guidance has not been regulated for organizations section 62 to churches or qualified church organizations. Therefore, again, we're back to the standard good faith interpretation, application of it if done consistently. And even though the the plan reg, which they told you was the safe harbor for tax exempts that aren't churches, again, if you use that, we're not going to argue with you, right? We're going to accept it. So that, that's all fine, right? We'll do it. So again, not saying that is the only thing a, a court will accept, but it is an acceptable way of doing it. And if your client is a conservative client, the fact that I can point to this and say, look, the IRS says this is it. So I know you've had other concerns, but they're basically blessing this. So we can go ahead and we're safe with this interpretation. I think we are basically safe with this interpretation. Now, they also then, now when they do these, they always present theoretical facts and they apply an answer. So they give you an example effectively inherently. So here we have an employer's organization exempt from tax under 501c3 of the code. National organization is managed by a board of directors. Members of board of directors are referred to as directors in the rest of this example. Employer X, an affiliate of national organization, is a subordinate organization in a group exemption letter held by national organization. However, this particular subpart, Employer X, right, asserts it's operating as an independent tax exempt organization. They have their own EIN, is managed by a board of directors, and none of the national organization directors is a director of this employer. National organization does not have the power to appoint any directors of this employer X. National organization also does not have the power, does not have the general power to remove any director of employer X or is a new director. And no director of employer X is an agent or employee of the national organization. Further, this employer does not have a general power to appoint or remove any director of the national organization or is a new director of the national organization and no director of the national organization is an agent or employee of X. So while we're affiliated with the large organization, our operations are effectively, you know, our management, everything is independent of the other organization. So they're saying that's the fact we're going to go with, right? And we're going to continue on a little bit more. Uh, it functions as a director of a chief executive officer who is selected by and reports to, the, to their board of directors. And these directors have the ability of employer X's bylaws to appoint or remove any director of employer X and designate a new director. Employer X asserts it's not, it does not need to aggregate with the national organization, cannot be aggregated too, because this is really in choice, right? You either are or you aren't. Under section 52, in determining its eligibility for and the amount of the ERC, Employer X has claimed the ERC for the third quarter of calendar year 2020. Then we have an alternative. So this is like example two, and they always tend to put these in the facts together. So you have to build them out. In this case, let's take eight, let's modify this example but we, but except the national organization has a general power to appoint or and remove and to remove or designate three of the five directors. So 60% of the directors, effectively, they can control. So if the organization was doing whatever they didn't like, they essentially could pull out three directors. Now have a majority of the board of directors who hire the CEO, which means we could fire the CEO then and do other things. So bottom line we have the ability to control the board. If national organization has that ability, does that change the answer? Okay. They're saying first, right, you know, because neither, neither, no, no director of employee X or national organization is representative, no director, agent, or employee of the other organization. In addition, neither organization is controlled by the other because neither organization has general power to appoint a director of the other organization or general power to remove a director is a new director. Because Employer X and National Organization are not members of a controlled group under Section 52, Employer X is not required to be aggregated with the National Organization to determine their ERC for which they are eligible. Employer X application of the controlled group rules under Section 52 in this case, this is the first example, right, is considered a reasonable interpretation of the rules and essentially they should prevail if they otherwise meet the requirements for their ERC claim, they should prevail and get the refund. In the second set of facts, 
the employer's assertion that they're too, that they're not a member of a controlled group under Section 52 is not reasonable good faith interpretation because national organization has the general power to appoint and to remove or designate more than 50%, uh, that is 60% or more of the board of directors of uh, 60% of those groups. They're a member of a control group under 52 and they're required to aggregate with national organization. Now, this is interesting because as I said, this is a safe harbor. So I would say example one is certain to carry in court. That is, if you're asserting it, the IRS is trying to claim that you're part of a controlled group and you're, you're totally in line and you haven't done anything really weird to kind of evade backdoor, but in reality, national organization controls you. You, know, you haven't done anything weird like that. Uh, yeah, they're, they're gonna be stuck with that. This one, again, the determination if this is a reasonable good faith interpretation if you don't follow the safe harbor, that would be up to the court. Here's where I'd say, yeah, in this case, yes, I, I would say you don't say that this ultimately controls, but you would tell the client that if this, if these are your facts, A, the service is likely on exam to refuse to pay you unless you qualify as part of the group application. And number two, um, if you want to challenge that, there's a very, very good chance if the service examines you and this is disallowed or they disallow your claim, that your only option is going to be to take them to court, which is going to be very expensive. Right. So question becomes, do you want this uncertainty over your organization? And that may cause various other issues. So again, now, does Looper Bright change this? Well, that, that's something a lot of people are asking too. Uh, as I said, Consider this carefully. First, this is only a chief counsel advice. It's not a binding on taxpayers. Rather, it's a legal analysis the court may or may not accept. It probably will be difficult for the service to argue that if, you, if, if this is your position, you are the first example and you take this position, the IRS is going to have a very difficult time probably convincing a judge why that's not reasonable when you put out a legal memorandum to your staff saying it was. Yeah, the judge is going to want God judge going to tell the IRS you got some explaining to do about why, and the judge is going to want to see why this situation is different than example one. It's not just that you now don't think example one's right anymore, right? They'll have a little more trouble if you've suddenly walked in on exam and for the first time said, "Yeah, we're not going to accept it anymore. It's not right." Uh, you know, as I say, it's fairly safe. Your position is consistent with the CCA. And a taxpayer still needs a reasonable basis position. If you're going to say this is wrong, you're an example to, and you're going to say flat out, we don't meet the requirements. We would come under that interpretation. We bring these as part of the group, but we're going to take a position. We're not part of the group. Great. But you first thing I got to have is I still need to see a legal analysis that gets me there. I don't want you to just tell me Looper Bright, because here's the first problem with Looper Bright in this context. Looper Bright does not apply to this because this never had Chevron deference, right? You might say it, it changes the viewpoint. I don't know that it does because this, you didn't need to go near Chevron deference. If you were a judge and you thought this was garbage, you didn't have to say a word about Chevron deference, right? Chevron deference didn't matter in this situation and it doesn't. Um, so I'm saying, in reality, Looper Bright should not change the result in this case at all, right? Because Chevron never, ever, ever applied to this, right? That's been clear for a long time, that Chevron deference doesn't apply to this. It's also been very clear it doesn't apply to notices, announcements, etc. okay? So there's my first case is it shouldn't change it. Now, I know there are attorneys and others that disagree with me on that one. Again, I'm not an attorney, uh, but I have been around tax law for quite a while. And so I'm covered under Circ 230, right? That, that, that's my way in. Uh, I will say that I would find it, I, I just don't see that Looper Bright changes the respect the courts will have for this merely because the courts didn't have to give any deference to it. At best, it, it could be persuasive to the court based on the IRS analysis. And yeah, you know, the, the court can decide if it is or isn't persuasive, if they like the analysis or not. And I don't think fundamentally it changed anything.
I would say if this was a, I would have had no problem taking the alternative position if I had a good legal analysis to back it up and the client was aware of the risk they were taking. I have no problem making that claim. And I don't think anybody else should. So my take is I'm questioning if you've been too conservative. If you're telling me now that Looper Bright suddenly says, I, I can file this. No, Looper Bright doesn't change whether you could or could not file this or in theory shouldn't change your chances of winning the case. Right, just, just simple, right? The, the loss of Chevron deference should make no difference here. Um, and like I said, and also please remember, even if a, even a reg is shut down by, uh, by loop, by basically by Chevron deference, I say now without Chevron deference, they knock a reg down, uh, you know, that they would have followed with Chevron deference before. Um, that doesn't mean normally there is no law. Now, in some odd case, we're going to talk about these listed transaction cases. Yes, there, if that reg's invalid, then it really does take everything apart for purposes of this being a listed transaction because listed transactions have to be listed. And we now know that, at least according to one circuit, they have to go through the regulatory process. But that's not the normal issue we're facing. Certainly is not the issue we are facing in the ERC. Nothing in the ERC said the IRS had to identify, right? these special cases or had to identify things or really do almost anything. So it's like not, nothing required the IRS to do something to identify what was going to be considered a valid or an invalid ERC claim in regulations. They had the, they were given authority to draft regs, uh, but nothing said those regs were going to be the ones that you had to wait for them because it's not like the list of transaction rules where they have to list it, right? That is a rare circumstance in the tax law but a lot of people seeing that have said, oh, well, the reg snapped down. We can do anything we want. No, that is an unusual, very unusual circumstance. And 99 times out of 100, if a reg gets knocked down, it just means you better show your analysis now and persuade the judge why that analysis is a good analysis. Rather than just saying, ah, no reg. So there's no rules. It doesn't matter what the law says or anything. We can do whatever we want. Not how this works. Keep that in mind. So this has been the Current Federal Tax Developments for the week of July 29th, 2024. Current Federal Tax Developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state side of CPAs. Uh, my email address for this, edzollers at currentfelltaxdevelopments.com. Uh, I also check in regularly with the Connect sites for the Arizona Society of CPAs, New Jersey Society of CPAs, um, the Idaho Society of CPAs. Uh, I always remember all my nice list here, right? For that, Minnesota. Um, Illinois. And so, you know, you might find me there. If I'm there, you're a member of those societies. You could check in there and see what's going on. Uh, also, like I said, we'll be back here next week. I've said before, be back here next week for whatever comes up new and updates. And obviously we're going to be keeping an eye out for those IRS announcements about what's happening to the ERC program as we get closer. But otherwise, I will see you next week with more current federal tax developments.